World War III has already begun. How the history books describe the beginning will depend on how it ends. How it ends will be determined by how the public reacts to the shockwaves to come. This cannot be predicted, but it can be influenced. Really another successful job. We're very, very proud of our military. We cannot allow Vladimir Putin to succeed here. The U.S. has reportedly launched dozens of cruise missiles at a Syrian government target. North Korea's military has issued a statement warning it would annihilate American troops in South Korea, quote, within minutes. The U.S. has dropped a large bomb in eastern Afghanistan. The current state of U.S.-Russia relations is at a low point. North Korea is going to be attacked. They will use nuclear weapons. One of the reasons that I was elected, one of the reasons that I'm standing here is called people want their military to be strong. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it. 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 Anytime the ruling class gets an inkling that we the people might unify on a higher ideal, join forces in the face of an existential threat, you'll always see them start sowing the seeds of division, triggering artificial group identities, pitting you against each other over trivia. Once in play, the temptation to join a side is overwhelming, and very few resist. Divide and conquer is an applied science. They know exactly how to ring your bell, and they'll go out of their way to promote any narrative that adds to the hate. If they succeed, the result is always the same. Resistance is dissipated, drowned out by the roar of petty squabbles, while the war machine advances. This is our first enemy, and it must be attacked head on. But now we turn to racial tensions in America. What do you say to the people who are who dragged a poor white guy out of a car and beat him? Oh my goodness, poor Trump. white people, please, oh my, stop. Stop it. I said I'm tired of, tired of being peaceful and tired of being calm, you know? They've been going to war on us for over 400 years, so I, I, ain't, I ain't peaceful, I ain't no protest, I'm violent. The path to war is always paved with crowd psychology. Those who don't understand this science are easy to manipulate. Activists who ignore or fail to work within its laws are rendered ineffective, or worse, utilized as pawns. They don't teach you about this stuff in school, for obvious reasons. This is the science of power, the psychology of control. An informed populace would recognize their tactics, neutralizing the effect. They would also have the tools to strike back, turn the tables, and fundamentally restructure the system. The status quo would be destroyed. The stakes are far too high to play it safe now, and we don't have much time. So we're going to break this down from the 30,000 foot view. The only way to stop a war when you have a government which is fully in the pocket of the military industrial complex is to reach the mind behind the trigger. You can do it in the army. Break the chain of obedience. A contingent of the police and military must turn. This is easier said than done, and most who try sabotage themselves in the first few words. They fail to understand the group identities they are working with. Soldiers are conditioned to obey. They are regimented using extremely efficient authority and conformity structures, and have a very strong and inflexible group identity. They are typically the last element of society to flirt with disobedience or insurrection. They only turn if a large enough civilian contingent that they identify with pressures them to. In the United States, military personnel overwhelmingly identify as conservative. Therefore, US soldiers would only consider disobeying a direct order or pointing their guns in a different direction if enough conservatives turn. You could field a crowd of 20 million progressives and it wouldn't even register. The conservative worldview frames the left as the outgroup, just like the left views them. And any message that can be framed as coming from the enemy camp is automatically rejected out of hand. Racism, fraud, conflict of interest, homophobia, sexual assault, 
transphobia, white supremacy, misogyny, ignorance, white privilege. Bigotry and, and distrust and, and a certain kind of supremacy. We have to do something about it. This, I'm sorry to have to put this out there, but it's not just going to be about coming to demonstrations like this. We're going to have to put ourselves on the line. I'm sorry to say this. What you've got is big, giant mega banks funding a bunch of communists and cop killers and other organizations that want to start martial law in this country and derail our elections. Hey, y'all. My name is Mangina, and I'm a gender-fluid, two-spirit, transracial, Muslim atheist, otherkin feminist, anti-racist, social justice warrior. Prepare a speech for you. Well, a few remarks, really. Feminism is cancer. Thank you very much. Conservatives tend to be older more established, with little appetite for catastrophic change. And right now, the man they voted for is in power. A spark of insurrection almost always begins with people who are young enough to still have hope and crazy enough to actually do something about it. This demographic also tends to lean left. To further complicate matters, these two group identities have grown farther and farther apart in recent years, and have even diverged linguistically. The only way to inspire a break in the chain of obedience is to build a coalition that is able to work with and ultimately steal market share from both of these group identities, galvanizing them in opposition to a common threat, like thermonuclear war, and defining an identity against a new outgroup. The madmen and useful idiots pulling us towards it, aka the neoliberal neocon corporate alliance. You may not have to cozy up with a bunch of leftist loontards. Ooh, I don't even want to be in a room with these misogynist bigots. We get it. You hate each other. They are not us. They're the out group. They're a hostile tribe that you're being forced to share a territory with. But then something horrific happens. An event that sends shockwaves through the culture, leaving deep psychological scars. At that moment, petty disagreements will be set aside. The political and media establishment will rally the masses towards their solution, war. You might hate each other now, but in times of war, you'll unify behind a flag. The outgroup will be redefined in geopolitical terms, and most will fall for it. A newfound sense of patriotism will wash over the nation, like alcohol to cover the fear, and the executive will be elevated to godlike status. Daddy is going to take care of you now, all you have to do is obey. And then laws like the Patriot Act and the NDAA, on the books for years but never fully implemented, will suddenly become terrifyingly relevant. There will be absolutely no restraints on power. In such times, group identity can be reshaped, rendered more obedient. Those who speak out will be branded un-American, or worse, exposing government lies Will become an act of treason. Examples will be made to set the tone. The rest will either cower in submission or flee. And we'll all be reminded of the saying, war is the health of the state. If they win, then they get to reset the system. Wipe 20 trillion dollars of debt off the board. Blame the collapse of stock, bond, and derivative bubbles on an external boogeyman. And have a controlling stake in the next global financial system. But this isn't going to go according to plan. And once a certain line is crossed, there will be no undo option. Wouldn't it be better to come to terms with the stakes, as terrifying as they may be, and unify ourselves on something worthwhile, a common ground that any sane human being can agree on, rather than let them have their way with us? Could we agree to unify just long enough to stop World War III? Could we not learn this lesson the hard way? A lot of you have already been feeling scared. These emotions are normal. And as the show progresses, you'll have more and more company. But it's not going to help us here. When afraid, our brains work much less efficiently. 
the rational, introspective areas shut down, and decisions are reduced to fight, flight, or freeze. Those in power always take advantage of this principle and use it to herd the population towards their goal. Rather than join the stampede, take a deep breath, reflect on the inevitability of death, let go, look at the big picture, the world we're leaving for our children, grandchildren, and beyond. We have to do something, and it's not the thought that counts. Results matter. They really, really matter. But how can we reach the mind behind the trigger when we're up against the most sophisticated propaganda apparatus humankind has ever faced? We don't have multi-million dollar budgets or the infrastructure and staff that such money can buy. Most of us are stretched to the limit, struggling to keep our heads above water. We don't have the means of setting up a large centralized organization capable of challenging the machine on its own terms. And even if we did, such an approach wouldn't work. The house always wins. When the odds are stacked against us and failure is not an option, we must formulate an asymmetrical response. As strong as the enemy may seem, the establishment has a vulnerability. In fact, they have an entire web of vulnerabilities. The official narratives on a whole host of serious issues, foreign and domestic, are built on deliberate and orchestrated lies. Lies that cover crimes so horrific that most of the population couldn't even fathom the possibility. Many of these lies can be debunked by using publicly available evidence, and this is an essential part of the battle, but at this stage of the game, it's not going to be enough. The floodgates need to be opened. Here we have to walk a very fine line. Some of what needs to be done will be dangerous. Some will straddle thin lines of legality or cross it explicitly. It's not up to me or anyone else to tell you how to handle that line. Each of us must choose our level of involvement. However, as the situation progresses, there will come a moment when it becomes clear that risks must be taken, sacrifices must be made, the laws of man superseded by a higher mandate. Some of you listening are positioned deep within the machine. You work among the gears, you have access to the tools and documents that the public doesn't know about, and you could get deeper access if you really tried. For some of you, monitoring this message might be part of your job description right now. Alphabet soup, I'm going to speak to you directly here. You and I both know why Trump flipped. We all know that Trump isn't running the show. He's dirty, and somebody got the goods on him. Dark stuff, the kind of dirt that guarantees obedience. Blackmail. The nature of the flip makes it clear where the hand pulling the string resides, in the upper echelons of the United States neoliberal neocon corporate establishment. The people you work for. Let's not feign naivete. If you want a hint about the kind of dirt we're talking about, look into his connections with Jeffrey Epstein. We begin with a story of sex slaves, underage girls, a billionaire, murder, a prince, and at least one former U.S. president. Right. He's throwing these parties, and there's also this talk about girl. I mean, you got Donald Trump even saying on the record, like, he likes girls, he likes them young. Bill Clinton. Nice guy. Uh, got a lot of problems coming up, in my opinion, with the famous island with Jeffrey Epstein. Well, look, the New York Times is totally in the tank for Hillary Clinton. Uh, they're faced with this terrible story about Bill Clinton flying around the world with a, a convicted pedophile. What has been the biggest scandal in the UK since World War II has now come to the US, and it may involve former President Bill Clinton. The story surrounds this man, billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, who served time in 2008 for soliciting prostitution. That charge came as part of a plea deal. It all began in 2005 when Epstein was investigated after a woman reported that he paid her 14-year-old daughter $300 for sex. Now, since that initial claim, there have been more than 40 women who have come forward with claims that Epstein is a sexual predator and that he not only abused them, but shared them with famous and powerful friends. You might want to look at how the story connects to the judge that let Epstein off with a slap on the wrist, Alexander Acosta. 
that would be the same Alexander Acosta that Trump nominated as Labor Secretary. Donald Trump had glowing words for his new Labor Secretary nominee on Thursday, but Alex Acosta could face some tough questions about his legal career during his confirmation hearings, particularly over a controversial plea deal he reached a decade ago with billionaire investor Jeffrey Epstein, who was accused of sexual misconduct with dozens of underage girls. There's more if you're willing to dig. Follow the money, trace the connections, phone logs, emails, campaign contributions. If you put your mind to it, you'll find evidence that involves senators, congressmen, top-level brass, banking, and the who's who of the military-industrial complex. Craven degenerates operating with impunity, totally compromised, totally controlled by the same people you currently work for. Blackmail is a crime, and in a case like this, it denies the victims justice. Blackmail against a sitting president is also high treason. And to use that leverage to start wars of aggression, a crime against humanity. The people behind this would hang in a fair tribunal. And maybe someday they will. The circus tent is coming down. The rot runs deep, permeating the core of the system. These are the dying breaths of a nation. It's time to decide which side of history you're going to be on, by action or inaction. The just following orders defense doesn't have the best track record. This isn't about Trump. This is about the 0.0001% that really called the shots. Trump is expendable. At some point, he's going down. The real establishment will install another puppet and they'll get their war. The great destruction. The reset. Unless, of course, you do something big. Strike deep. Strike in a way that slows down the agenda, knocks them off balance, discredits their warmongering lies, buys humanity some time. Now I'm going to speak to the civilian population of all nations. With the exception of those who are clever with the locks and keys that keep this kind of information out of sight, most of you don't have access to the innards of the machine, and never will. You do, however, have access to people, and in the end, that's what this will come down to. To maximize impact, study the principles of group psychology. Gustave Le Bon, Edward Bernays, The Psychology of Power. This weapon has been used against us for centuries. Time to pick it up and return fire. Pressure must come from all sides. To stop this war, you will need to study the worldview of both the left and the right. You must internalize their narratives, learn to navigate the wedge issues, identities, images tied to words, towards an urgent awareness of a common threat. We have to learn to distance ourselves emotionally from issues that distract, discipline ourselves to avoid the trap of pointless arguments that will never be resolved. We must choose battles that can be won and win them by sending more and bigger bullets down range while adjusting fire, not by obsessing over how each volley lands. Some of you are going to want specific instructions, steps one, two, three, and four. Some of you are waiting for someone else to lead. What we need right now, and we'll need even more in the times ahead, are decentralized nodes of leadership, operating independently, creatively, with the skills and resources they have, coordinating, amplifying with other groups. Seek those willing to commit to a simple, self-evident moral stance. No wars of aggression, covert, conventional, economic, or nuclear, regardless of who is in office. No supporting such wars in word, silence, action, or inaction. This is a line worth dividing on, and an anchor worth unifying on, identifying with. Don't know how to find such people? Start by speaking out. All it takes is one voice to break the conformity principle, to expose the fact that the emperor wears no clothes. Someone else might find their courage because of you. Once you start taking action, you'll start meeting others who are already in the trenches. People with experience and skills you lack. Perspectives that clarify things further. Now you can coordinate, synchronize, and amplify. You'll also make new friends, and the group might become more than a means to an end. 
Finally, you must address the elephant in the room here. Fear. The danger of a global escalation is real. Sugarcoating it won't help. Narratives which put heads in the sand definitely have a market. The question isn't so much whether your hands will shake. The question is whether you will find the courage to do what needs to be done anyway. Again, it helps to reflect on the inevitability of death. None of us will be here in 200 years. Look at the big picture, the world we're leaving for the next generation. It can also help to plug into something bigger than ourselves. Pray, meditate, connect to whatever you want to call it, however you believe you should. Struggling to decide what to do? Unsure of the right path? Go to the source. Ask like you mean it. Put all that emotion you have pent up in your chest into it. This doesn't have to be quiet, sitting down, formal, or planned. It can take the form of dance, music, or even just tears. When our brain is operating at this frequency, ideas often arrive out of the blue. Good ideas. And now your emotions are calm. You see a step you could take now. A simple goal that you know you can accomplish. And you're not afraid to start. In fact, you're excited. This isn't just something worth dying for. This is something worth living for. That's what we need. Follow that feeling. Take action before it slips away. <laughs>